Yeah, I, I don't want to upset somebody, you know, because obviously you don't want to be on the internet uh, and have some rubbish things said about you. Where is Vikas gone? He's out there. He's okay. I'm here, sir. Okay, one minute. No, I'm trying to find you on my computer. So you're the host now, Vikas. Okay. Yes, sir. So just take over all that and uh, let's start doing some uh, case presentations. Okay. Now, the aim of this uh, session is uh, that we try and talk so get you guys involved rather than me doing the talking however i have tried to make sure that every question that i ask i'll try to put up an answer for you okay so eventually you will know what is the correct answer that's what that's the whole name of the game that's why it, it takes a bit of time to prepare something like this uh, but uh, of course uh, there is no right or wrong just talk to me at a consultant level okay so it is one consultant talking to another consultant don't don't talk to me as a as a mbbs student okay so we will have a very adult discussion whatever we do and this is all true life so this is what's going to happen so imagine that you're a consultant sitting in your outpatient clinic and whatever scenario i put to you that is what's come to you and then from there on, you, you take away, take it away. Okay. And then I have put some theory behind it as well in the whole process. So a lot of it is revision from my previous lecture, which I've done on media spinal masses. So that way we will revise the topic as well. And we will get confidence about speaking. Okay. All right. And it is, it is not meant to humiliate anybody. Okay. That I want it to be very clear. This is educational and only educational. So if I ask you a difficult question, it doesn't mean that I'm trying to be awkward or trying to put you down. Please do not misunderstand that. I want everybody, whoever is going to participate in these case presentations, please understand it is always meant to be educational. And the other thing that I want to make sure is that when one person is talking, let him talk. And then if somebody wants to raise an issue, then just raise your hand and Vikas will let you in and we will answer the question accordingly. It is an interactive discussion. So if you feel like interrupting, do interrupt, but try to pick up the pause in between a conversation to interrupt so that you don't uh, discourage the, the, the participant, the student from his answer. Okay. But do stop us at any point and discuss because it is important that you learn from this uh, exercise. Okay. Everybody happy with that? Uh, you yes, can sir. keep your microphones on. It's not a problem. But let uh, today uh, is going to be Simran who's going to answer. And if we finish in time, then uh, Nikhil will take on the second case. And then everybody will get a chance. I'll, I'll grill, grill everybody one by one. Okay, Simran, you're sitting in your uh, outpatient clinic at uh, Kokila Ben. And a 45-year-old man comes into your clinic gives you a two month history of chest pain with exertion. He says he's also got non-productive cough, got a bit of malaise, a little bit of weight loss, around 10 pounds he's saying. And somewhere in the periphery, he went and got a chest X-ray, which showed something in the mediastinum. Okay, I, I, sorry about the anterior word, it just says mediastinal mass. So now I want you to talk to me Simran, about how you will take a history. So we, we'll go from very basics. Is that okay with everybody? So we'll, we'll try to highlight some things within the history. Again, it's an adult discussion. So don't talk about, uh, you know, very minor things. Talk about major important things in the history that you want to elicit in this patient. So, so since he's a 45 year old man uh, with history of chest pain uh, with exertion and cough and malaise, uh, we like to ask him since when is he having this uh, chest pain? Since when is he having the cough? When is, most importantly, when is he having the malaise? And the weight loss has been uh, over how much uh, time? Uh, the second okay. thing I want to illustrate in the history is the uh, history of smoking. Uh, because uh, any thoracic malignancy, intestinal malignancy, uh, smoking is a very important uh, uh, component of the history. Uh, how many packs uh, per year? And uh, uh, if he's, uh, it, when was the last time he smoked? Sometimes these people uh, have a history of previous smoking. Uh, another important thing in uh, uh, media channel cases is uh, history wise is uh, history of uh, uh, occupation. Uh, what was his occupation uh, previously? What is his occupation currently? And um, so, has, name, uh, any, any... so, stop. Name some occupational diseases. What is the correlation? 
uh, source of people working in coal industries uh, will have uh, uh, more amount of uh, uh, carcinomas. People working in asbestos will have uh, uh, asbestosis or uh, uh, malignant mesothelomas. Uh, people working in um, uh, uh, cell batteries, uh, battery industries have more uh, chance of uh, malignancies associated with them. Uh, people working in uh, marble industry have uh, 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 silicosis, uh, pneumoconiosis associated with those. All right, that, that's uh, so fine. Then, Carry uh, on. Carry on. Uh, so the, then the, the type of chest pain is having what are the uh, factors which aggravate the chest pain or when does the patient have it when does the patient have a chest pain does the patient is there any uh, positional uh, variations uh, with the chest pain uh, what are the aggravating what are the relieving factors and okay, uh, has so, it, uh, is he on regular med medication for the chest pain okay so so the way to answer this question is sir i would ask about origin uh, origin duration progression relieving and aggravating factors so all of it is in one line okay in the yes, exam sir. If ever somebody tells you what qualities of the chest pain are you looking for, you have to talk about origin, duration, progression, aggravating, and relieving factors. Get this line into your head, write it down, and just keep blurting it out every time in an exam so that you don't waste time talking about you know other in more detail. So the moment you tell me you're looking for ODP, that's fine with me. Okay. All right, go ahead. What are the uh, things so in the history? Uh, so then regarding his cough, uh, whether it's a productive cough or a dry cough, uh, uh, regarding malaise, whether it's associated with any constitutional symptoms like fever, uh, whether the fever has any cyclical uh, uh, time to it, uh, whether he has evening rise of fever with loss of appetite uh, indicating towards uh, tuberculosis, uh, he has loss of weight. So it, that might be uh, associated with tuberculosis. What else? Um, Give me four or five, four or five symptoms in the chest which you really want to elicit. So one, you've got chest pain, you've got that. You have cough there, and you have weight loss. So three are already in front of you. What else? Uh, so, uh, in a any, chest uh, case, any, do you any, ask any history of any history of dyspnea? Okay, that's uh, any history of. Uh, uh, Basically, we're trying to rule out uh, whether it's a respiratory case or a uh, cardi cardiac case. So from those aspects, we'll ask the cardinal symptoms of uh, uh, cardiology and cardinal symptoms of uh, respiratory. Uh, uh, yeah, but I'm looking for one symptom which you've missed. That's why I'm asking you this question. A very important symptom, which I want to know. Not necessarily in this patient, but in any chest case. You've got to ask for chest pain, cough, weight loss. Dyspnea and what else? There's one more important, very important symptom. So wheezing? No. Okay, uh, Nikhil, can you answer this question? Just only answer this question and then step back. There's one more Hemop symptom I'm looking for. Hemoptysis. Thank you. That's very important. Okay, back to Simran. Hemoptysis. Okay, very important. Is is that all right? I, I mean, I'm. Again, I want to stress the point. Hemoptysis is very important. Yes, sir. Now, if you have a sim case, chest case with hemoptysis, what are the questions in uh, history about the hemoptysis that you will ask? Uh, so, the uh, whether the hemoptysis is associated with cough, uh, whether the, the quantum of uh, hemoptysis. Don't forget ODP. Or origin, yes, duration, progression. Yes, sir. You know, aggravating and relaxing. I want you to say these things. So, you know, what are specific things about hemoptysis in addition to ODP? What else will you ask? So, talk about ODP, which I understood. Now, what else will you ask? Uh, aggravating so the, factors the, we got and relieving factors we got. What else in a hemoptysis would you like to ask? So, the, the quantum of uh, the quantum okay. of the, uh, so very is important. Out. Quantity is very important. Agreed. What else would you like to ask? So is he coughing out, uh, uh, is it only blood or is he coughing out uh, some blackish material along with the blood? So type of blood, is it red? Is it, uh, you know, darkened or is it clots? Is that important? Yes, sir. Okay. Why, why is that important? 
so because uh, if it's associated with an aspergilloma, uh, it might it might be uh, uh, it might be uh, blood along with the fungus at, uh, hyphae coming out. Yeah, yeah, but but first one, why why is red and dark important? What does it suggest? Uh, so fresh bleed would uh, indicate a, a bleeding higher up in the uh, respiratory tree, and a fresh bleeding would indicate a, a, a malignancy. So red and dark, what is the difference? And between? dark blood would be uh, would be uh, old uh, clotted blood. Okay. Also, arterial and venous bleed. Okay, this is also yes, this, is, this give you an indication whether is this an arterial bleed? Is it a bronchial artery which is bleeding, or has it eroded into a venous blood? Okay, right. Different. The two bloods are different. Agreed? Definitely, definitely. Bright red is arterial bleed, and then a dark red is venous bleed, and a clotted blood is something that is distal and lying there for a little while. Is that okay? Yes. All right. Okay. So. Carry on. Tell me a few more things in history which I'm listening. Uh, smoking. You spoke about smoking very early. So tell me, how do you calculate pack years of smoke? So, uh, so the number of uh, number of packs the person has uh, smoked, and how many years he has smoked. Uh, so that's a number which has to be multiplied. So suppose what, he smoked. Uh, what is a pack? One pack is twenty cigarettes. Okay. So if he smoked one packet uh, for uh, 10 years, so it becomes uh, 10 pack years. So that means he smoked one packet for 10 years or 10 packet, 10 packet a day for one year. So you must know what is a pack year, okay? You must be able to explain to the examiner what is a pack year. Okay, what else in the history in this patient will you specifically ask? There is a few other things you've forgotten in the history. I'll tell you why you've forgotten, because your mind has gone malignancy. So always keep an open mind, keep benign and malignant in mind, and think that way. Don't just jump to malignancy. Uh, so whether it's associated with fever? We got that. What else do you want to ask this time, the history? Okay, I'll ask you the question in a different way now, okay? Give me differential diagnosis for tumors in the anterior mediastinum. So, uh, uh, so thyroid, uh, oh. uh, thymoma, teratoma, uh, lymphoma. Um, okay, that's fine. T-cell lymphoma. Those are the four T. Those are the four T. That's how you remember them. Yes, Excellent. Sir. Now, do you want to tell me any more questions you want to ask in the history? Uh, so, uh, uh, to rule out uh, thyroid, whether he's having uh, a symptom of uh, hyperthyroidism, if he's having uh, uh, tremors in his hand, if he's having uh, sweats, if he's intolerant to um, intolerant to uh, uh, warmth, if um, if his appetite's okay, is he losing weight, which he is. What is the commonest tumor in the anterior mediastinum? Uh, so, uh, thymoma. What is thymoma associated with? Uh, so, compressive um, uh, symptoms of compression. What systemic disease is thymoma associated My with? Mycena gravis, yes, of course. So, any history of. Uh, so, now I come back to the question. Do you want to ask any more questions in the history? So is he having any uh, weakness uh, with the, any diurnal variations? Uh, is he having weakness which is uh, uh, which is better which is better in the morning and uh, as the day progresses, it becomes uh, worse and uh, worse and worse. What specific weakness are you looking for? Uh, so uh, so if he's having any ocular symptoms uh, with drooping Good. of uh, eyelashes, uh, diplopia. Uh, if he's having uh, difficulty in uh, articulating words, if he has any difficulty in uh, uh, swallowing. Or uh, if he's having uh, muscle weakness, is a proximal muscle, muscle weakness because in myasthenia you have proximal muscle weakness uh, compared to uh, uh, distal muscle weakness, which is seen more in uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome. So try not to throw in words, uh, throw in diagnosis, yeah. okay? Because if I go down the route of Guillain-Barré, you'll be in deep trouble. Okay? Yes, sir. So try to stick to just thymoma <laughs> and uh, answer only with relation to the thymoma. Okay. Uh, blood vision, do you think blood vision will happen in thymoma? 
uh, so no, not blurred vision will happen. There will be diplopia, which uh, might uh, 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 he might say that it's blurring of vision, but it's actually diplopia yeah. happening. The commonest thing in history that the patient tells you, history is what the patient tells you. Okay, he doesn't tell you he's got diplopia. He tells you I've yes, got sir. blurred vision. So yes, the commonest sir. history that you get is blurred vision. Okay, so blurred vision, drooping of eyelids. Facial weakness, more importantly, difficulty in swallowing. You forgot to say that this phagia is a very important symptom of uh, thymus. Okay, agreed? Now you've done the important. I'm sorry, Simran, I don't mean to be rude. I'm just no, sort no, no, of no, pointing sir, not out all something. Sir, not all, sir. Not is, that, all, sir. is that all right? Okay. So this, this is common what happens in the exam because you get so swayed by the, yes, by the, by the weight loss that you completely forget about myasthenia and dramas. Okay, it's very yeah. common. This is very common. That's why I put these symptoms specifically, because I want you to get swayed, get caught onto one of those and then go down the other route. Okay, all right. So, uh, what else? Uh, lymphoma, what do you think will be the history? Anything particular uh, in lymphoma? Um, so lymphoma, uh, there'll be a uh, uh, history of swelling in multiple sites of the body. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it's associated with the uh, type B symptoms, which is fever, malaise, uh, general body ache, okay. uh, those will be That's common. Fine. Then there'll be, there'll be uh, there can be variations of, uh, uh, there'll be a 21 day cycle of uh, fever, which can be elicited in some patients. Yeah, so you can get a history of fever, more diurnal yes. variation. Okay, good. Now, uh, is everybody happy? I, I want people to come in and tell me if this is the way they, you want me to continue this case. Just give me a feedback quickly because I need to understand that you are understanding what we're teaching. Yes, yes. quickly. Is it making yes. sense how we are going yes, about yes. this? Yes, sir. This makes a person into spotlight okay. and uh, it simulates the exam scenario. Yes. Okay, everybody okay with this? And sir, and sir actually, what you okay, said is so very now... true. You just stop thinking. <laughs> that's that, that's why I'm putting in, you on the just... spot. Yeah, come in. Who's that? Yes, sir. So this is Vikas here, sir. Yeah, so this is this is exactly how things start in FRCS examination. We'll Fantastic. we'll be standing standing in front of the patient. The examiner will tell. So this is a 45 years old man, complains with chest pain, non-productive cough, malaise, unintentional weight loss for 10 10 10 weeks or 10 10 kg in one month. Yeah. So speak to ask him what is the problem. Okay. So good. What are the five six things as an examiner you expect me to ask? Because he will give me less than one minute to ask history, and then Absolutely. he'll move on to examination. So what okay. are the five things, like you said, we must ask history of blurring of vision. We must ask uh, how much. So what are the five, six things which you expect as an examiner that I must tell in that one minute? Okay, good. So so everybody's on board so far, so good. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll just stick to history a little bit more purely for educational purpose. In the exam, I would have probably moved to examination by now. But I'm still going to ask you a couple of histories more, which I want to know. Anything else you want to ask this guy? Any other histories you want to ask this guy? Is this is for education? So any other history in this guy? Uh, not that I can think of any. Uh, can I take some? No, no. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Put, put, put. Let him be on the spot. So, uh, come on. How do you take a history? Suppose he's had previous CABG. Will that change your uh, uh, management? Oh yes, of course. Uh, whether he's have history of any previous uh, intervention will uh, will change our approach uh, to the surgery. So if he's so, had a previous so, it will it'll, it'll, it'll alter our management. So past medical history you will ask. Yeah, past important. Medical history, yes. Past medical history you will ask. Okay. Anything else you want to ask? His sister had lymphoma. Family history, yes, sir. Yeah, you want to know family history of cancer? Family history, yes, sir. Yeah, quite important, isn't it? Yes, so th these are the few things that you have to come up with, okay? So I'm just going to go ahead. Please read this chest X-ray for me. Uh, so this is a uh, and uh, posterior anterior view of a chest X-ray. No markers are seen. Uh, showing uh, uh, cardiomegaly with the CT ratio of about uh, 60 to 65 percent. Uh, uh, there is a the airways look normal. Uh, the lung field on the left hand side look normal. Right hand side look normal. 
uh, the right, left hand side shows a, a cystic lesion uh, in the uh, mid zone um, mid zone of the chest x ray uh, with the vascular markings bronchovascular markings uh, appearing uh, more or less uh, normal uh, the left uh, cardio the left uh, uh, costophrenic angle is uh, obliterated and the cardiophrenic angle is also blurred and uh, the soft tissues and the ribs uh, uh, appear uh, pretty much normal okay so first and foremost which i would jump at is you started the chest x-ray with cardiomegaly uh, I, I i completely disagree with that actually uh, I'll, I'll tell you because there is something which is superimposing on the heart. Okay, that is why you feel that this is cardiomegaly. This is not cardiomegaly. Okay, there is there is a mass here. Can you? There is a mass here, yes, sir. which is which is superimposed on the heart. So you're feeling as if the heart is going all the way to here, but this is not cardiomegaly. This is actually a mass here. Okay, and please do not use the word cystic because this right. doesn't look cystic to me in any way. Okay. This is not so, cystic, okay? This has got multiple, there may be fluid, there may be solid components. And most important, which I actually wanted you to pick up was that there is playing of the carina. Can you see this carina? Yes, sir. There is a splaying of the carina. What does that suggest? Uh, so that's just a subcarinal lymph nodes? No, 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 uh, more or, with the primary tumor, what does it suggest? The tumor could be growing into the mediastinum. Tumor could, it? yes, sir. Tumor could be going into the mediastinum. Just causing the carina to be splayed. You can see there, splaying yes. in the, of the carina. What do you want to do? If I just show you this x ray, give me two answers which will help you with further uh, information. Two answers, okay? I want two. So you have to give me both the answers. So, uh, uh, CT scan? before that ct scan will do eventually but if i gave you two options for this x-ray something which will help you to make a better diagnosis what are the two things you will do or you ask me for them i'll give it to you nikhil i'm going to ask you this question Give me two things that you want to look at the moment you've seen this chest X-ray. Lateral chest X-ray. To find Very out. Good. Very good. Excellent. Why do you want to see lateral chest X-ray? Uh, to see the uh, site of the uh, mass, whether anterior mediastinum or a posterior mediastinum or a Absolutely mediastinum. correct. Absolutely correct. Because on this film, you can't make out where this mass is. Is it in the anterior or in the posterior or in the middle mediastinum? So you need a lateral chest X-ray. What else? One more question I want you to answer. In fact, that answer should have come first. But tell me, what else do you want to say? What else do you want to say? Come on, guys. Any radiology. Anytime I show you any radiology, what is the first question I want you to ask me? So previous slide. Previous x-rays. No, previous. no. Previous x-rays. Full stop. Well done. Thank you, Simran. Okay. So Quite whenever sure. I throw an x-ray at you and I ask you, what else do you want? You should say, sir, show me the previous x-ray. Because if the mass is the same in an x-ray 10 years ago, are you worried? No. So you understand it's not, it shows that disease has not progressed. Or if there was a normal chest x-ray six months ago and suddenly you've got an x-ray like this, then you're really worried because this is a fast growing mass, whatever it is. And the second thing is a lateral chest x-ray. Okay. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so good. I'm happy with that. Now, just quickly revising what we look for in a history. So if it's a myasthenia, particularly look for patterns of oculum. And this is not a lecture, okay? So I just put a few points in my mind just for you to sort of remember. So diplopia, bird vision, dysphonia, vocal cord, dysphagia, progressive weakness, and more at the end of the day okay these are the sort of things that you have to answer me in a question in an exam okay uh, don't forget uh, asking for fevers night sweat chills malaise uh, 
things like for looking for lymphoma and GCT, these are the things that you have to look at, okay? Don't forget about past history in terms of previous malignancies. Uh, smoking history is very important. Prior chest surgery or radiation is very important, okay? Because it will change your management. Cardiopulmonary disease is extremely important. He's 45. He's at an age where he'll start to develop cardio cardiac disease. You don't know that, but you do need to know what is the problem. And most importantly, comorbidities. You need to know comorbidities in this patient. Okay. All right. So let me, sorry, go back. Okay. So now, uh, Simran, are you okay with that? So far, so yes, sir. So we haven't, just on a history, give me a brief synopsis in one line and, and a differential diagnosis. Uh, so 45 it, year old uh, the the, lat the lateral picture showed anterior medial spinal right so sorry i got out there so there was a phone from the hospital uh, sorry about that uh, so so 45 year old uh, gentleman comes with uh, uh, comes with history of uh, malaise uh, weight loss uh, uh, and uh, so differential diagnosis in my mind would be uh, thymoma uh, teratoma uh, t cell lymphoma and um, uh, uh, thyroid uh, 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 thyroid mass. Okay, I'm okay with that. All right. Uh, don't forget tuberculosis as well in your country, okay? Because this could be matted TB lymph nodes. You don't know that. Yes, so sir. keep tuberculosis in mind as well. Always in a, anything that you give, always throw in tuberculosis at the end because a matted group of lymph nodes might look, uh, might present in an anterior media stuff. Okay? All right. Yes, so sir. now you are going to physically examine this patient. Again, only at a consultant level, talk to me at an adult level. Tell me what are the things you're going to look for. Uh, so, uh, so from the uh, respiratory, respiratory examination um, on... Um, first, uh, first do a general examination. Uh, so just so general talk a examination. Little, what are specific things in a general examination you want to look for? Gen general examination, you uh, look for uh, uh, ptosis. I look for uh, 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 muscle muscle wasting. I look for uh, fasciculations in the muscle. Uh, it is a proximal muscle in his um, uh, thinar eminence, uh, in his uh, bicep. Um, uh, there might be a neck drop. Um, the other things to look this for. Guy, this guy is in your clinic. Yeah. Just look at him. See what are the things, common things that you look at. Go, go systematically. Just common things which will have significance in this guy. So, uh, uh, any uh, anemia, uh, raised JVP. Okay. To uh, okay. see for uh, obstructive uh, 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 syndrome, ICC obstruction. Then, uh, How do you do a general examination? So, so uh, temperature, uh, heart rate, respiratory rate, uh, temperature, and uh, BP. Yeah, so and then, do you think any of these will be changed? Uh, no, sir. Respiratory rate might be a little on the higher side, but not, not, not significant, sir. What else? What could be changed in the TPR, BP? Um, what, so will then, a uh, what will a thyroid mass cause in a TPR? Uh, so swelling in the uh, swelling in the neck region. No, no, no. Tem movement. Temperature pulse respiration. What will a thyroid mass cause? Uh, re uh, tachycardia. Ah, so talk simple things. Huh? There could be tachycardia. There could be a raised respiratory rate. Why will the respiratory rate be raised? If at all it is raised, why would a respiratory rate be raised in an anterior uh, mediastinal mass? So if there's uh, compressive uh, symptoms on Absolutely. the on, on <laughs> the on the trachea, it will cause the yeah, respiratory. It will cause a raised respiratory rate. Yeah. What else? Come on, keep talking quickly, quickly. Don't waste time. What else are you looking for? Physical examination. The guys in your office. What are the specific things that you want to look at? So I would look at the pulse. It's very important. What else? Uh, so then, uh, 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 
Go systematically, go systematically, just how you would do it in an exam. What do you do in your clinic every day? Uh, so did you look for uh, anemia, uh, cyanosis, yeah. uh, uh, jaundice, raised yeah. and edema feet? Okay. Uh, uh, one thing you forgot actually in this. It's J A C C O L. That's what you look for. Jaundice, anemia, cyanosis, clubbing, edema feed, and and what is the L for? Lymph nodes. Yeah, lymphadenopathy. Lymphadenopathy. This case is very important, lymphadenopathy. Yes, sir. Yeah, this case is bang. Lymphadenopathy is the most important thing you're looking for. Where will you look for lymphadenopathy in this case? So, uh, uh, cervical, uh, uh, cervical lymphadenopathy, uh, axillary lymphadenopathy. Yeah. Uh, so you look generally. You look everywhere, wherever you. Everywhere, can. yes, sir. So good. Lymphadenopathy is important. Why? Uh, so uh, Hodgkin's lymphomas uh, will be Absolutely associated correct. with lymphadenopathy. Non-Hodgkin's will be associated Absolutely with uh, axil, axial lymphadenopathy. Absolutely correct. So lymphadenopathy is very important. So don't in an exam don't get phased because I'm asking you pointed questions. Always stick to your pattern. Your pattern will remain the same. TPR, BP, J A C C O L. Okay. General examination is always done like this. So don't change your general examination because I'm asking you pointed questions. Okay. And each one of those are important. Jaundice, what is the significance of jaundice in this patient? Uh, so if there are metastasis to the porta, which can cause jaundice. Liver mats, liver mats, yeah. You can have hepatic mats, which might cause jaundice. So very important. Edema feet, what is the significance of edema feet? So edema feet is patient. associated with the uh, uh, malignancies which cause uh, wasting because of uh, loss of uh, proteins. Uh, loss of protein can lead to generalized uh, edema feet. Then, uh, mediastinal mass, what is the commonest cause? Why will it cause uh, venous, edema feet? Venous congestion will uh, lead to, um, uh, if it's compressing on the venous return, that, that can lead to edema feet. Absolutely correct. So you can have compromised venous return or you can have cardiac compromise. It cardiac could be compromise. compressing on the heart. Yes, okay, anything compressing on the heart can cause edema feet. Agreed or no? Yes. Sir. Okay, so everything in the general examination is actually very important. Okay, systemic examination, what will you look for? Uh, is it getting too end. detailed for you? Simran, no, is it getting too detailed? No, are you no, no, okay? No, no, are you no, comfortable? No, okay, so yes, just tell sir. me, in systemic examination, what are you looking for? Uh, so, sir, on uh, respiratory system examination, um, on uh, inspection, we look for uh, 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 trail sign. We look for uh, uh, any scars and sinuses uh, in the on the on the chest. Okay. What else will you look for? Uh, then we look for the uh, the respiratory movements. Okay. Uh, whether he's using his uh, extraneous muscles for uh, uh, breathing. Okay. What else will you look for? Uh, uh, any swelling uh, in the lower part of his uh, neck, which is uh, moving with the deglutition, would point towards the thyroid uh, thyroid mass. Uh, if there's uh, bulky swellings uh, in his uh, bulky swelling in his uh, uh, cervical uh, region, what else uh, will then you look for? On uh, uh, palpation, we'll uh, confirm the tracheal sign with the centrality of the uh, the trachea. Uh, no, 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 no. Just uh, on inspection, what are you looking for? I want. A very specific thing that you have to look for in inspection in an anterior mediastinal tumor. And I don't want to rush it through, okay? I want to take time over this so that everybody understands what I'm trying to do. There are some very important points which I'm trying to make. So take your time. If you can't answer, then I'll ask Nikhil if he can answer. Nikhil, what else in an anterior mediastinal tumor on inspection of the chest will you look for? Uh, sir, collaterals, dilated collaterals. What, are, what does that signify? Uh, it signifies in the compression on the superior vena cava. Thank you very much. So you look for facial edema and signs of collaterals on the chest wall. Okay. Please, everybody write this down. This is very important. Anytime anybody shows you an anterior mediastinal tumor, you've got to look for SVC compression. It is mandatory. It's clinical examination. Okay? 
So just on inspection of the chest and the face, you will know that the guy has got invasion of the SVC or compression of the SVC. Okay, so facial edema, neck edema, and collaterals on the chest wall are extremely important. Agreed? Yes, sir. Okay. Carry on. You've finished your respiratory. You've listened to his heart. Uh, what else do you want to do in the physical examination in this case? Is it getting boring or is it still significant? No, no, sir. Okay. All right. Carry on. What else you want to see? Uh, what other systems you want to examine? Sir, and uh, why? The, sir, neurological uh, symptoms for uh, neurological uh, system for uh, uh, muscle weakness. Yeah, before neurological, what else you want to do? You don't go to neurological. You, neurology is the last so, one you do. Before that, what do you so, do? Uh, the cardiac system and the, yeah, the abdominal system. system. Absolutely. Why the cardiac and why the abdominal? What are you uh, looking for in cardiac and what are you looking for in the abdomen? Sir, uh, uh, cardiac wise, valvular heart lesions can uh, lead to respiratory uh, complaints. Uh, yeah, but more than that, you're looking for pericardial involvement in this patient okay pericardial, anterior uh, things so yes, you're looking for is there a pericardial effusion is there any pericardial pericardial yeah pericardial is there evidence of uh, pleural effusion on the two sides you understand that so is there evidence of compression of the heart is there muffled heart sounds okay these are the sort of answers i want in the exam yeah because this is an anterior major spinal mass it can very easily cause pericardial effusion and you can also yes. get pleural effusion. So these are the signs I want to. You should come out with this bang, bang, bang. Okay, there is no, no, two ways about this. Okay, abdomen. What are you looking for? Um, so. What are you looking for in the abdomen? Are you there with us, Simran? Oh, sorry, I can't see you. Hello? Have we lost him? Okay, Nikhil, come in. What are uh, you seeing in the abdomen in this patient? Hepatosplenomegaly and uh, ascites. Yeah, more hep hepatomegaly first, rather than splenomegaly. It's hepatomegaly, but you're right. You also got to look for splenomegaly. Why? Uh, so if it's a lymphoma, the... Good. Very good. So in a lymphoma, you get splenomegaly as well. Okay, good. What else in the examination are you going to do, Nikhil? What else in the examination are you going to look for? Uh, in the abdomen or the other parts? Everything we've discussed so far, what else you are going to look for? Tell me. In the abdomen, what are you going to look for? Come on, guys, quickly. Don't waste time. Nikhil, what else are you going to look for? Which is uh, part so of the abdominal system. Uh, scrotum. Thank you. Testes. You will, you will, if it's a male patient, you will examine the testes and the scrotum. Very, very, very important. Testes and the scrotum are very much part of the abdominal system. Okay? Why do yes, you sir. want to look at the testes? Uh, sir, uh, saminoma can metastasis. Uh, uh, germ cell tumor in the testes. Yeah, good. Okay. So, yeah. So, teratomas, seminomas, germ cell tumor. These are the things you want to rule out. So, you want to make sure that the primary testes is okay. And then the last examination, what else is left? Which system is left? Oh, he was talking about central nervous system. So, you want to check for power and you want to check for reflexes and you want to check for sens sensation. Okay. So you do yes, a proper sir. CNS examination in, in a patient with myasthenia. All right. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Okay. So let me just quickly go through a few things here for you. So these are the sort of things that you look for. Okay. Uh, let me just, uh, okay. So cervical and supraclavicular lymphadenopathy is quite important. Don't forget to look for inspiratory, expiratory stridor which suggests a dynamic airway compression. Look for decreased breath sounds or pericardial rub. Don't forget pleural effusion and perica pericardial involvement. Don't forget for facial swelling and chest wall veins. 
which will suggest an SVCO. Okay. Yes. Sir. And the next thing that is there is sorry, is the same thing which is come up. Abdominal examination, which is a genital examination in a male patient. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. All right. So far, so good. Yes. Okay, Nikhil, now your exam is still continuing. Yes. How do you define the mediastinum? I'm going to ask you a couple of questions on that. Uh, submitting. Dif yes. Divide into uh, superior and inferior. Uh, mediastinum and inferior uh, mediastinum divided into anterior, post, middle, and posterior. What divides the two? Uh, so the uh, superior and inferior mediastinum is divided by a uh, imaginary line joining from the ang uh, sternal angle uh, to the fourth uh, uh, thoracic vertebra, inferior border of the fourth thoracic vertebra, and the superior border is the thoracic inlet. Okay. Good. All right, so everybody knows these things. I, I won't go into details. I'm assuming you know what comes in the superior, what comes in the anterior, what comes in the middle, and what's common in the posterior mediastinum, okay? So this is just for revision, all right? So things in the anterior mediastinum are here. Things in the middle mediastinum, this is how you define middle mediastinum. Parietal pericardium anteriorly, parietal pericardium posteriorly, angle of Louis, and diaphragm is at the bottom. And then these are the common things in the middle mediastinum. Okay, this is just to revise with you guys, okay? Before we carry on with the case. Okay, and posterior mediastinum is defined anteriorly by the parietal pericardium, posteriorly by the vertebral bodies, superiorly by the angle of Louis, and inferiorly by the diaphragm. And these are the common. Neurogenic tumors are common in the posterior mediastinum. Everybody okay so far? Yes, sir. Okay, what are the common mediastinal masses uh, seen in adults? Nikhil, this oh, is for you. Yes, sir. The anterior mediastinal masses uh, thymo, arising from thy, uh, thymus, thymoma. Uh, in Carry on, keep talking. I want you to uh, yes, talk. Sir. Thymoma, uh, uh, <clears throat> cyst, uh, like uh, bronchogenic cyst, pericardial cyst, uh, mass, uh, malignant masses like lymphoma, germ cell tumor what is common in children uh, so nephroblast uh, sorry a neuroblastoma keep talking yes sir okay uh, so now all right so, you, so you've got this guy 45 year old with an anterior mediastinal mass <laughs> what is the next investigation that you're going to do I like to do a, a serum creatinine level for CCT chest examination. Okay, all right. So you want a CCT chest, okay? Uh, if you, if I asked you to do some blood tests, what would you do for this guy? Sir, uh, serum alpha fetoprotein, beta SCG, and LDH level. And in case if I suspect myasthenia, uh, then uh, serum acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to show you the CT uh, because it's getting a bit slow. So I'll just. So these are the investigations for imaging. Can you see my screen is still? Yes, sir. So CECT, CT guided biopsy, PET CT. Now my question to you is, you've got all these investigations. Obviously you'll do CECT first. What is the next investigation after CECT? Or, or just wait, I'll show you the CECT. Here is the CECT for this guy. Can you see it? Yes, sir. So there is a head. one minute. I'll show you one more view. Just see the other one as well.
Okay. So I've shown you this. Now describe that CT to me. Uh, so the, uh, it's a contrast enhanced CT uh, showing well defined uh, heterogeneous uh, mass in the left uh, chest uh, invo uh, involving from the uh, upper to the mid of the thorax. Uh, in upper part, it is uh, uh, it is not involving the chest wall, but however, in the lower part, it's involving the it's abutting or involving the chest wall along with uh, the mass has uh, uh, well defined borders, but uh, al along with it, uh, there is a plural effusion and associated atelectasis of the lung on the okay. left. However, I, uh, there, there seems to be a mediastinal lymphadenopathy as well. Uh, talk a little bit more about the mass and the relation of the blood vessels. So may I take this down, sir? Are you back? <laughs> Sorry, just, sir. Just, this is let, let, that's all right. Let Nikhil finish. He's, he's already in there. So mm. Nikhil, describe so, this a little uh, so little bit more about vessels, but uh, uh, abutting the blood vessels. Uh, Which blood vessels is it abutting? The aorta. And? And a, a pulmonary artery. OK. And what is happening here? So it, uh, may, you know, it involving the chest wall. Okay, good. So I'm happy with that. So good, you've described to me the findings quite well. There is evidence of an anterior mediastinal mass, which seems to be involving the chest wall. It is also compressing. It's going all of the way around the aorta and also involving the pulmonary artery. And there is evidence of pleural effusion. And there is some mediastinal lymphadenopathy. Okay, good. Now, Simran, come back in. Uh, did you see the CT, Simran? Yes, I did, sir. Okay, differential diagnosis, quickly. Uh, so, differential diagnosis uh, first would be thymoma because this is a, a mass arising from the medial sinum and going into the uh, pleural cavity involving uh, it's got pleural effusion. Uh, it can it uh, it might be a uh, thyroid, but not likely because the mass is well below the neck and it does not have any uh, contrast enhancement, neither, neither does it have any cal calcification. Uh, it cannot be, a, it, it might be a lymphoma, but sir, it's not uh, conforming to the anatomy of the uh, of the structures and uh, it is a, a smooth uh, smooth surface uh, extending into the pleural cavity. Uh, uh, neither, why, why, uh, why do you think it's not a lymphoma? Uh, so because lymphomas usually have a very typical uh, appearance of uh, conforming to the anatomy of the uh, surrounding anatomy. Can never be sure. Can never be sure. I have Can seen lymphomas sure. looking like so. Don't jump into that one. Okay. Still keep all your options open. And okay. I would not rule right. out lymphoma. Not as yet. Okay. What else? All right, sir. And uh, so, uh, teratoma. So for teratoma, we'll be looking for uh, the classical uh, features of uh, 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 different kind of uh, tissue in it, like uh, fat, bone, uh, teeth. So yeah, that's, none a, of them that's, that's the benign tumor. What about the malignant one? Uh, germ cell tumor or a germ, seminoma? Germ cell tumor, yes, sir. Seminoma, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. it, can, it can be one of those. Yeah, so it can still be one of those. You don't know that. Yes. Okay. So don't, don't, at this stage, don't jump into ruling out anything. It's yes. still possible. The commonest thing possible is what? Uh, so thymomas. Thymomas. Okay, so more likely to be thymoma, but you cannot rule out anything else. Yes. So what is, you've just done your uh, CT scan. What is your next investigation for this patient? Any so, blood uh, investigations you want to do? Let's come back to that. The blood investigations, we'll uh, like to look for uh, antibodies uh, against the acetylcholine uh, receptors, which are the uh, MSK antibiotics and, and uh, the LP, uh, LPR4 antibodies. Keep talking, keep talking. Don't worry. You just uh, keep talking. We like to uh, look for uh, 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 alpha fetoproteins, beta HCG to rule out uh, non-somatomatous uh, non germ cell uh, tumors. Um, then we like to do a thyroid uh, thyroid function test, uh, TSH, T3, T4.
See, whenever anybody asks me a question on blood investigations, I start with routine, and then I talk about advanced tests. So are, is, is routine investigations important in this patient? Uh, so is a CBC is, important? Uh, so CBC has a, a general uh, general workup. And, no, no. Uh, what is the importance of CBC in this patient? Uh, so they, they, they might be um, um, uh, they might be anemia, which which can be a paraneoplastic syndrome of thymoma as well. They are, they are known to have uh, pure red cell uh, aplasia. What else? So the WBC count uh, um, uh, can be raised in uh, these situations. Yeah. What else? Nikhil's already pointed out the uh, the the raised uh, the the creatinine for uh, uh, CT then um, uh, LFTs if there's a raised <laughs> LFTs. LFTs. Why will the LFTs be raised? So if there's a, a metastasis to the liver, that can be cause of raised LFT. If there's metastasis to the port of the liver, there can be uh, raised uh, uh, raised bilirubin, um, and uh, with the SGOT SGPT going up. Yeah. Okay. What else? And then you will do all these markers. Okay, I won't. I won't grill you too much on that. At the moment, I'll try to be a little kind to you. Okay. So we've spoken about that. So what is your next investigation? Uh, so, uh, so we can. You've do done the bloods. Rest. You've done the bloods. I'm happy with the bloods. Uh, the liver function is normal. Uh, there is no anemia. There is no evidence of uh, anything else. Uh, this is the patient in front of you, 45 years old. What are you going to do? Uh, so we can do a, uh, the PET scan, but uh, the PET scan is not going to give us much more information uh, because if you're suspecting a thymoma, uh, actually we should do a PET scan, sir. Uh, we should do a PET scan. Okay. So will you do a PET scan before or will you do PET scan slightly later? Uh, so we'll do a PET scan at this stage, sir. Okay. I'm okay with that answer, actually. But some people will argue with you that actually there's another investigation you should do before this. What is that investigation? So what's, the next, what's the next investigation in this guy? So, so MRI scan? No. What is the next investigation in this guy? What do you want to do? If you say PET scan, I'm okay with it because I actually like that philosophy. But most people so, will give me another answer. What tissue, do you do? Uh, uh, CT guided biopsy. Yeah, absolutely. CT guided biopsy. You want to know what the hell you're dealing with, isn't yes, it? Yes, sir. Yes, so you sir, don't even need a CT. This might just be an ultrasound guided biopsy because it's right against yes, chest mob. You don't even need a CT guided biopsy. So now my question to you is, Will you do a PET scan first or will you do a CT guided biopsy first? Uh, just so, give me some, some so logic so behind it. PET, PET scan, sir, because if we do a CT guided biopsy, some of the lesions can uh, light up and lead to a false, uh, false positive. Okay, and what else in tumors? Why, why else do you do PET scans? So, uh, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a chance of converting, uh, uh, upstaging the tumor because you might break the... Break the you can call that, it. Yeah, that is actually... It's a, that is, there is no evidence to... to yes, sir. Theoretically, it's possible, but most people have not, not come up with evidence to suggest that your capsule gets breached and you get upstaged. Okay, but theoretically, you're okay to say that. I'm all right with that. But um, why else do you do PET scan? In, not, in such a, uh, not in such a big mass, but in a small mass, why else do you do PET scan? So to, to rule out any uh, metastasis. Yeah, more than that, to rule out metastasis. And the other important thing is you might get a superficial lesion somewhere which might be easier to biopsy. You know, if it was a smaller mass deep within the vessels, you would be worried about biopsying it. So you might yes. get a superficial mass which you could biopsy, or you might get a supraclavicular lymph node, which will give you, uh, the biopsy will give you a lymphoma diagnosis. You understand that? So that's why, yes, a so both ways are okay. I, I don't mind the discussion going, that I'd like a CT guided biopsy first in this particular patient. But if you told me PET scan first, give me the justification for it, and they are both all right. So there is no right or wrong to it. But in my clinical practice, usually we would do a PET scan as a part of the workup before we put in a needle. Because once you put in a needle, it does uh, sort of you know mess up the uh, scene a little bit. Okay, so the 
CT scan has shown this, uh, sorry, the biopsy has shown this to be a thymoma. Uh, uh, before that, what biopsy will you do? So we can do a, 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 a true cut biopsy or core needle biopsy. How about an FNSC? Uh, so we can do FNSC, but more the, the, the tissue uh, obtained by a true cut or a core needle biopsy will be more than an FNSC. The thing is, in an anterior mediastinal tumor, it's very difficult to differentiate between a lymphoma and a thymoma. Hence, FNAC is not advised. Okay, so you have to say this in the exam. An FNAC is not advised. You actually need a core biopsy because you have to differentiate between lymphoma and thymoma. And many, many, many times the pathologist can make a mistake and call it a lymphoma. What is the importance of differentiating between a lymphoma and a thymoma? Why do you want that differentiation? So for, thymo, for, for lymphoma, it's a medical management, whereas for thymoma, it's a surgical... Uh, Absolutely surgical correct. Management. The treatment is world apart. Yes, for sir. one, you give chemotherapy, for the other, you operate. So it's absolutely mandatory that the histology, the biopsy, is, should be conclusive. So that is why FNAC is never recommended for an anterior mediastinal mass. It's always got to be a true cut biopsy. Okay? So you have to emphasize these. These are important clinical points uh, because many, many uh, cases happen where wrongly it gets reported as lymphoma, as thymoma. You go in and operate and it turns out to be a lymphoma and then you get sued, okay? So very important that the first biopsy has to be accurately done. What would you do if the answer came back as inconclusive? Are you so still with us? Yeah, yes. Sir. So uh, uh, one option is uh, if if you got a swelling anywhere else, like you said, we can biopsy that. that uh, we can biopsy that. There are or, no swellings uh, we, elsewhere. What so we can uh, we can we can either do a re uh, if we can either do a re um, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, we can do a media stenoscopy. Or we can what, uh, what media stenoscopy? Be very careful when you say media stenoscopy. So what are you talking about? Which operation are you talking about? So this this will be very easily approachable by the Chamberlain's uh, Chamberlain's uh, uh, approach. So we can do a left uh, anterior, left anterior media stenotomy. Okay. Anterior media stenotomy and get a absolutely chunk of correct. For, for absolutely correct. So if the biopsy is negative or inconclusive or not very sure, I would just go in through the second intercostal space and take lots and lots of tissue. What is the one thing you will do on table while you're doing an anterior media stenotomy? In this patient. Uh, somebody else switch off your microphone. Your, I can hear your water running. What is the specific things if you're doing an anterior media stenotomy in this patient? So you can uh, put in a scope and have a look at the pleural cavity. You may not get the space because you're right on top of the tumor. What is what? What you want to do to make sure you've got tissue? Frozen section. Absolutely correct. You will do a frozen section till the pathologist is happy because this is a second time procedure. So you will always do a frozen section, not for diagnosis, but just to make sure that you've got enough tissue. And if the pathologist says he wants more tissue, you continue taking more tissue. You understand? This is a very important clinical point. So you always do frozen section, not because they can tell you thymoma, lymphoma on a frozen section, but you want to make sure that you've got adequate representative tissue and you've not got just the capsule. So you keep digging in till the pathologist comes back to you and says that, thank you, I'm happy with this tissue. Okay? So very important. The, the frozen section part of it is very important. Okay. So here we are. So we do an FNSC is not advisable in this. Sometimes if it's a very deep anterior mediastinal tumor, you can do an EBUS or an EUS. But uh, occasionally you might end up with doing a surgical biopsy. So now I'm going to talk about anterior mediastinal masses. All right. So tell me, 
how do you classify anteremia? So far, are you happy with the diagnosis? Yes. Uh, there's one more thing you've forgotten in this. Sorry, I forgot to say, ask you. There's one more investigation which you forgot to do in this patient. Uh, Just wait, Nikhil. Which is of clinical significance. I've shown you a picture now. So, uh, echo. Okay, agreed. What else? More important with relation to the diagnosis and stage. Uh, 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 cytology of the pleural fluid. Thank you. Cytology of the pleural fluid is very important. Why? So because then it becomes a uh, uh, stage four. If the if the cytology comes back positive, it comes it comes back uh, it come back, comes back as stage four. So, and then we'll so, have to medically uh, uh, treat him uh, treat him by uh, radio, radio chemotherapy rather than surgery. Okay, so we'll talk about the management. Just hang on, don't jump in with it. But it is a non-surgical management moment. Yes, it sir. becomes plural fluid positive. Okay, so yes. very important to talk about cytology. Okay, I'm going to take a small break here. I want to ask the audience to come in and tell me, are we going the correct way? Are you understanding the concept of management of an anterior mediastinal tumor? If there's something that you have not understanding, please tell me. I can change the way we ask these questions. Come back and give me feedback. I, I really want you to get this once and for all. That's why I'm asking you to participate. Vikas? Is it okay? Yes, sir. This is exactly the way things go in exam. You keep on answering and they go to the next question. Exactly the same. Okay. So, so far, so good. Everybody's understanding. It's not yes, getting yes. Too, too, too stressful, isn't it? I'm, I'm trying to no, sir. keep to the points. It's very, very important. Okay. Okay. Now we've got this. There is one more thing I want to ask you, uh, Simran, before I go on to talk about what is the treatment of this, okay? Or what is the staging of this? I wanted to ask you, uh, you've done these investigations. So how do you divide investigations in terms of uh, a clinical patient? When a patient is sitting in front of you, there are two sets of investigations you do. One is for diagnosis. What is the other set of investigations? So work up for surgery. Yeah, so for fitness for surgery. Okay. So fitness always, whenever you're asked a question, what investigations you do, you must always say, sir, I will do a set of investigations for diagnosis and a set of investigations for fitness for surgery. And that just covers everything. Now, purely yes, because we're doing this for the first time, Tell me what investigations come for fitness for surgery. Uh, so, uh, uh, PFTs would be a, a set of investigations for fitness for surgery for classic cases, sir. Okay. Uh, then, uh, uh, depending on what is uh, 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 FEV1 and uh, FEC and uh, DLCO is, uh, then we'll uh, uh, assess whether he requires a cardiopulmonary assessment. Okay, so we will talk about that when we do a lung case, okay? In this, sure, sir. just generically tell me what else will you do? For cardiac fitness, what are you going to do? Uh, so for cardiac fitness, we'll uh, do a, a ECG uh, and an echo and uh, we'll uh, take, uh, uh, we'll uh, rule out the risk factors for uh, uh, any cardiac intervention. If anything is positive, we like to take a, a cardiology opinion and uh, fitness for surgery. Okay, and there is another set of investigations. If this guy goes drooping of eyelids and everything, then what do you want to do? Uh, so if he's got drooping eyelids, then we'll have to uh, have him assessed by a neurologist, and we'll have to do uh, okay. how, how much is the reversibility of of his um, uh, of his mastitis gravis uh, symptom, whether he can be managed with the medications, or whether he requires any plasma or uh, IVIG uh, to uh, uh, to decrease the dose of his. Uh, uh, so what test do you what test do you do physically in your so, clinic uh, for myasthenia gravis? Um, so I Vikas, come in and tell us what test would you do for myasthenia gravis? EMG, sir. Okay. Nerve conduction study. Conduction. EMG. Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. That's quite important. You need to do an EMG. Uh, but what is the most sensitive indicator or the most easiest indicator to alert you about need of post-operative ventilatory support in a myasthenia patient? 
tensile on test tensile on no just say. okay single nerve fiber uh, study no train of train of fall if there is if. no as a clinician i'm sitting in this thing i want yeah, to know i got the patient there i want to know whether this guy will have respiratory problems or not post operatively in a mastery what is the test that you do we ask the patient to raise the hands and keep in that position no you want to know the breath holding sir want... no what, what is the one test that you can do not breath holding more than that i mean which which a pft is the basics of basic of pft what is the one test you do in the opd post vital capacity explain what test but that is for peak flow peak flow, peak flow. Yeah. okay you, you have that thing in your thing yes sir. ask him to blow into it and give you a peak flow and actually peak flow should be used post operatively in a myasthenia patient it's a very sensitive test which tells you very early that the patient's peak flow is dropping and he's going into crisis okay it's the easiest test that you can do by the bedside of the patient to understand that his respiratory muscles are weak or not weak okay does that make sense what i just said yes sir okay good all right so now you have done all your tests this guy is a myasthenic uh he's on uh, you know uh, all the medication for myasthenia is well optimized your ct scan has shown this uh, your trucker biopsy has shown this to be a thymoma type b uh, you have uh, you have worked him up cardiac wise is fine so before i go on to the management i want you to explain to me how do you stage a thymoma Uh, what so are thymoma, the various classifications uh, that you know to so stage a thymoma used, uh, so commonly used uh, uh, staging is uh, masoka koga staging then you have the who staging and then you have the tnm uh, tnm staging uh, 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 okay so the masoka the, koga, yeah just stop so for masoka so before we go on to clinical management just tell me about the masoka koga staging what is 1 2 3 and 4 so uh, the masoka stage 1 is a, a tumor which is micro uh, which is a, a microscopically and microscopic uh, macroscopically en encapsulated it can have uh, invasion into the capsule but not through the capsule uh, stage 2 is a microscopic uh, invasion um, uh, microscopic invasion through the capsule or macroscopic invasion into the surrounding tissues uh, stage 3 is a microscopic invasion into the surrounding mediastinum uh including a uh, not involving the blood vessels and uh, b involving the blood blood vessels and uh, type uh, stage 4 is uh, uh, invasion into the uh, pleural space with the uh, pericardial or pleural, pleural effusion okay so i'll just go through it again with with the picture so everybody look at the picture so capsule is absent but no invasion okay so that's stage 1 everything is well encapsulated or microscopic into the capsule but not transcapsular he was right 2a is gone transcapsular but it is still microscopic 2b is transcapsular but limited to mediastinum 3 is involving the vessels direct mediastinal into the vessels 4a is uh, sorry just let me come back 4a is involving the pleura okay pleural nodules with pericardial nodules and 4b is distant metastasis okay are these pictures clear i just try to simplify it for you guys okay are we okay just say a yes if you're okay yes sir okay who classification tell me about who classification so who classification is type a which is a medullary uh, medullary or spinal cell uh, type ab which is a combination of both uh, type b1 is uh, a cortical thymoma a predominantly cortical might have lymphocytic uh, component to it type uh, b2 is uh, cortical thymoma type b uh, type uh, b3 is a typical uh, 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 thymoma uh, and then you have the uh, thymic carcinoma which is type c okay good very good i am happy with that that was very nice nicely said well done uh, simran uh, any any idea about survival Uh, so, so type one masoka type one has a survival uh, of ninety. Let's go to TNM staging one, two, three, four. 
and survivals with relation to tnm staging uh so uh, type 1 is uh, tumor uh, limited uh, only to the uh, only to the only to the uh, thymus with uh, no metastasis uh, with no lymph node no metastasis type 2 is uh, uh, tumor invading into the uh, mediastinum locally with no lymph node no metastasis uh, type 3 is a tumor invading into the great vessels uh, or the pericardium with no lymph node no metastasis type 4 is a tumor uh, so no no type 4 uh, the type L 4 uh, type so listen listen to my question the, my question is in terms of staging you have stage 1 2 3 and 4 okay yes sir depending on tnm staging i i don't want to go into depth of tnm at right, this sir. moment right sir what is survival with stage 1 so, 2 3 and 4 so stage 1 has uh, 96% survival and at uh, what? 20 years at what 5 years, years or 20 years of uh, 5 years i had uh, i had 20 years uh, tumor free survival is 89% uh, stage 2 is uh, uh, 86 to 96 percent uh, five-year survival and 20-year survival uh, without uh, tumor tumor free survival is about uh, uh, 91 percent. Uh, stage three is uh, 90, uh, 69 percent five-year survival and uh, around 40 uh, 50 50 percent uh, 20-year tumor free survival and stage four is uh, 50 percent five-year survival and uh, almost uh, uh, 40 to 50 percent uh, 20-year survival. So, sorry. 0 percent survival stage. Oh, sorry. Okay, let let me just go through this again. The reason why these two slides are very very important. Okay, uh, these are very important slides. These are the two slides which make change your management. The reason why these slides are very important is because even if it is stage four, get this message. Okay, please get this message. Even if it is stage four, there is a 50 percent five year survival in literature. and that is why whether the pericardium is involved whether the pleura is involved you still must treat the patient aggressively you understand the message which i am getting across to you and yes. this is the message you have to put to me in the exam that if anybody asks you a question of survival you must say that even if it is stage 4 the survival is 50% and that is why any tumor anterior mediastinal tumor should be treated aggressively we are not talking about whether chemotherapy radiotherapy or surgery but we have to treat it aggressively and it's always a multi modality treatment did you get this this is an important point a philosophy which i want you to get across to the examiner in the exams does that make sense yes sir yeah even look at the stage 20 year survival stage 1 2 and 3 is pretty good so you must treat these guys aggressively okay all right now let's come back to this case what are you going to do next uh so off arm surgery oh oh that is very dangerous young man i will i will fail you if you tell me that straight away mm. what are you going to do with this guy simran you're still on the spot If you tell me, I would offer him surgery. I would fail you there, straight away, <clears throat> because my philosophy in the exam, when I am examining you, all I want to make sure is that you are a safe doctor. You are a safe doctor who makes decisions in favor of the patients after consultation with colleagues. That is my purpose of the exam. So now, when I ask you, what are you going to do next? You have to tell me what are you going to do next. Don't say surgery; that will upset me. What are you going to do next? No, still Simran. This is a very important point. I want him to understand this, and everybody to learn from this. What are you going to do next, Simran, in this patient? Uh, so uh, we're going to. We've already worked. Through. Are we going to assess his fitness for surgery? You have done that. Everything is done. Now you have to start treating this guy. What are you going to do next? What do you do in your clinical practice? Do you take this guy to theater? Uh, so we'll we'll uh, we'll discuss it in the MDT. Yes, 
absolutely right. right. Do not okay, okay, okay. in right. any clinical case, so, any clinical case, doesn't matter right, what, right, 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 right. any clinical case, you have to say, I will discuss in a multidisciplinary meeting. Very, 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 very important. You understand that? Yes. I'm sorry, I'm getting excited about this, but no, it is, no, no, no. Yes, it is sir, mandatory because you cannot unilaterally take a decision yes, to sir. operate on this patient. Okay? So it's very important not to do that. Uh, just give me a cup of tea if you don't mind. Sorry, sorry, yeah. My wife came running to see what was happening. <laughs> sorry, Simran. No, no, sir. Not all, sir. Not all, sir. All right, so uh, this is very important because actually in an exam, if you tell me you're going to operate on this guy, I will be really yes, upset with you. I'll be, because actually, if you look at the CT scan, there is evidence of, yes, of vascular involvement. Yes, sir. And there is evidence of plural involvement, plural, maybe. Plural involvement, yes, we don't sir. know that, maybe. So I will be very upset if you told me I will operate on this patient. You, you understand why I'm getting agitated? Yes, no, definitely. Because definitely, definitely. this is an error you cannot make in an FRCS exam. Because it shows you are not a safe surgeon. You understand that? That's why I will discuss this in a multidisciplinary meeting. Mandatory. Absolutely mandatory. Okay? Now tell me what are all the treatment options in front of you? Uh, so, um, so one is uh, uh, surgery. One is uh, adjuvant, uh, uh, new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy followed by surgery. One is surgery followed by uh, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy uh, and surgery followed by adjuvant chemotherapy and uh, radiotherapy or, uh, uh, or uh, a definitive uh, radio and chemotherapy. Okay. Okay. So now what will make you decide whether this guy should have surgery first? Or what will make you decide that this guy should have some new adjuvant chemotherapy? Uh, so the, the decision for uh, whether it's surgery first or uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery, so the, the whether we can um, resect the tumor uh, with the R0 uh, resection. If we, cannot, uh, if we cannot be sure of the R0 status of the surgery, of the resection post surgery, then it's better to um, uh, Offer the patient uh, a new adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, downsize the tumor, and uh, then uh, then restage him. If uh, okay. there is any chance of uh, uh, R1 uh, resection, then uh, even if we think that we can uh, do a complete resection, then it's better to subject the patient to post-operative uh, 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 chemo radiation therapy. Sir. Okay, so that's good. I'm happy with that philosophy. You have to actually think that you should be able to have for R0 resection. If not, you must offer him chemotherapy before and then reassess and then offer the guy surgery. Is, now, my next question to you is very specific. Is there any role of R1 resection, stroke debulking in this sort of patient? No, sir. Uh, no, sir. It'll, um... in, the, in an anterior mediastinal tumor, is there any role for R1 resection? No, sir. Okay. Uh, Nikhil, do you want to take this question? It's a difficult question, but I want you to I want you to think about it and tell me, is there any role for R1 resection in an anterior mediastinal tumor? Uh, sir, uh, I'm, I'm happy with the Simran's exam answer. He said no, and he stuck to it. What about you? What do you think? Uh, sir, in this patient, uh, involvement, uh, it's a uh, uh, stage four. So, new adjuvant therapy and downstaging will be the better. Uh, will be the. I will offer him this. However, no, no, that was uh, not my question. Uh, sir, my however, mind. debulking will uh, help uh, if uh, uh, debulking will help to reduce the doses of chemotherapeutic agents and uh, uh, and uh, interop. Uh, uh, Mm, application of clips will help a radiation field to define the radiation field. Okay, you stick with your answer. Uh, Vikas come in and listen to my question carefully. 
because is there any role for R1 surgery in anterior mediastinal tumors? I've not said thymoma. I just said anterior mediastinal tumors. Because what do you think? If, if our, our histology says it's a thymoma, there is a role of debulking surgery. If it's a thymic carcinoma, there's no role of debulking surgery. That any other? Okay. Uh, any other situation where there is a role for R1 resection? In anterior mediastinal tumors, any other role for R1 resection? Anybody else wants to come in and tell me? Sir, may I? Saranshu? Please. Yeah, Saranshu, please. It's uh, a sir, very in benign teratomas, uh, which are invading uh, vital structures in benign teratomas, uh, we can do an R1 resection. Yeah, that, that, that's benign. We're, we're talking about malignancies, actually. So, in a malignant anterior mediastinal tumor, is there any role for R1 resection? Benign, I agree. That's fine. You're right, Saranj. Anybody else wants to come in? It's a uh, philosophy sir. I wanted to understand. Who is it? Sir, uh, sir, uh, myself, Dhanesh, sir. Uh, Tell me, Dhanesh. Uh, sir, we should uh, actually target R0 resection in, intraoperatively. However, if the R0 resection is not possible, we can uh, uh, sometimes have to uh, accept R1 resection. Uh, keeping uh, the, the clip should be applied along the uh, the margins of the tumor so that we can give the radiotherapy in the post operative period yeah okay but 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 with that philosophy you should always try to go in with an r0 that yeah. i completely agree but that's not my question my question is in your experience with anterior mediastinal tumors is there any situation clinically when you might do an r1 resection and it is acceptable so, so if it's causing uh, any obstruction to the SV, if it's causing any SVC syndrome, then can we do an R1 uh, R1 resection? Okay, that's one way. But but in those situations, I actually give chemotherapy, reduce the size, hoping that the SVC compression becomes less, and then I operate. Or I will stent the SVC and put yes. him into chemotherapy and then give things. We'll discuss all that. These are all. My question is very and it's a very it's it's an important question because it frequently gets asked in the exam. So what is the role of debulking in anterior mediastinal tumors? When do you decide to do that? So I'll give you the answer because I think you guys don't uh, are not able to come up with it. Myasthenia so, crisis? Myasthenia crisis. No, actually, it's more dangerous to operate on a patient with myasthenia crisis. I would control the crisis first before I do. Uh, the, the answer which I'm looking for is when the when you're going in for definitive chemotherapy or chemo radiotherapy, particularly in a case like a germ cell tumor, yep. you've given the full treatment, you did a PET scan, and you found that there's still some vague activity in that tumor. The tumor size may have reduced, but not gone away completely, and it's still invading a few things. In this scenario, you must operate because A, you want to reduce tumor load, that's number one, and two, you want histopathology of the remaining tissue of that uh, mass to know whether this is necrotic tissue or is it malignant cells present within the thing so that you can decide a second line of chemotherapy or immunotherapy. Have you understood what I just said? Did everybody yes, understand? Yes or no? Yes, it's sir. a very important thing. Okay. So there is a role for debulking in particular tumors when you finished your chemotherapy and you've still got tumor present, but you don't know whether the PET scan is showing necrotic tissue or is it live tumor cells. And so the, so the oncologist doesn't know whether he should give a second cycle of chemotherapy or not. Because if everything comes out to be necrotic tissue, then he's very happy to just follow up the patient. He will not give a second line of chemotherapy. You understand? In that scenario, you go in with an idea to do R0, but even if you're doing an R1, that's acceptable. And then of course you put clips all around wherever you are, just so that when the histology comes back, you can decide whether to give radiotherapy in the post-op period or not. So this is, this is a very complex situation uh, anterior mediastinal tumors and many different answers can come through. 
But first philosophy is you should always try to go in whenever there's an R0 recession. That's one philosophy. The second philosophy is that you operate debulk the tumor, reduce the volume of the tumor so that chemotherapy will act on the patient. That's the second philosophy. The third philosophy is you give chemotherapy, reduce the size of the tumor to make it amenable for surgery. Okay? And the fourth philosophy is completely chemo radiotherapy as a definitive treatment, particularly if it comes out to be a lymphoma. Have you understood these four separate concepts? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Very... yeah, yeah. Who is this? Salman Khan. Yes, Salman. Tell me. Uh, what about the technicalities of surgery addressing a tumor after chemo and radio? Yeah, they are all difficult. I mean, none of this surgery is easy. So, uh, in intraoperatively, when you go in there, the philosophy is you need a live patient. So, you don't try to do something seriously heroic and compromise the life of the patient. So, in that situation, you do an R1 rather than an R0 research. You understand that? But you never go in with an idea thinking that you're going to do an R1 research. Did, did you understand this philosophy? It's a little sort of subtleties of the philosophy have to be understood. Only thoracic surgeons will know this, how we make a decision when to operate on this patient. The technicalities are very important because if it is going into the SVC, then you have to decide to do an SVC resection. In fact, there are people who are also doing aortic resections along with thymomas. And I'll show you some papers on that in advanced cancers where you try to get R0 as far as possible. But most common surgeons will not do that. Very, very few series around the world have done that. So you must try for R0. If you cannot do R0, then R1 is acceptable. But if you're going to do R1, you have to put clips everywhere. And you have to make sure that the patient is referred afterwards for adjuvant radiotherapy to those areas. Did, did you understand that? Or are you more confused? Uh, no, sir, I understood. So it is a limited surgery. But the only uh, query is that the tissue, the tissue identification the extent where uh, until when we can do and where, where we cannot do. Yeah, that becomes difficult. You're right. So, so it, is, it is technically very challenging. It's not an easy surgery. And particularly if the patient has a chemo and radiotherapy, it becomes even more difficult. So where you stop, that comes with experience. That is why these sort of operations should be done only by experienced people who are doing a lot of these, not an occasional surgeon. Okay. One, 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 sir. One thing, sir. May I just interrupt, sir? Yeah, I'm recommend. Sir, uh, just one quick thing. Uh, after a cycle of uh, standard chemo, you find some residual disease, and uh, as we just talked about, we go in and uh, get it out, whatever is remaining, because we, we need yeah. to know what's there. Yeah. And then, uh, if uh, you come to that point where you give a second cycle of chemo, then yeah. if you haven't left anything, if you have gotten an R zero. Uh, then how would you assess the response because you haven't left anything there? No, if you've got an R0 resection, but histopathology shows live tumor cell within the tissue, then it is mandatory. The MDT will decide to give a second cycle of chemotherapy because what you can't see is the microscopic cells around. Systemic right. therapy. This is systemic therapy. Okay, got it. Because this was already metastatic or systemic in the first stage. So you don't need to uh, see and uh, have any residual tissue there because no, no, it's no, a systemic no. disease. For, following surgery, you don't do a restaging. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've done the chemotherapy, you've done a restaging, you've done your uh, surgery, you've got the histopathology back. Histopathology says all necrotic tissue, just follow up the patient. If the histopathology says Positive cancer cells within the tissue, second line of chemotherapy. You do not need to do a restaging after after wow. surgery. Do you understand that? Right, sir. Okay. Is it is it making sense? I'm very sorry. Yes, it's sir. a very complex topic, and that is why I'm taking my time and I want to make sure everybody understands the nitty-gritty of anterior mediastinal masses. It's not just about doing a thymectomy or things like that, okay? Is it making sense? It's the decision making which is very important in these patients. Okay, so now coming back to this case, uh, back to you, Simran. Are, are we still okay? It's 6.30 in the evening. Are we still okay? 
Yeah, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I mean, I, I the others are good. Yes. Sir. Okay. Yeah. Come back. <laughs> Come back in Simran, and tell okay. me what are you going to do for this patient in the MDT? How are you going to discuss this guy in the MDT, and what is your treatment plan? By the way, just for your information, this patient was uh, actually discussed with me by Shaji uh, from uh, South India. He actually sent this case on thoracic surgeons and we had a very, very big discussion about this case. So what is the next step for you, Simran? Tell me quickly. Simran, are you with us? Yeah, I'm thinking so. So what's the treatment? Are you going to operate? I'll tell you the vessels are, are involved. They don't look right. Yes, sir. And, and also I'm telling you, you what's the finding. There is a fusion. The vessels are yes, involved. Sir. They don't look right. Uh, the pleural effusion has come back as negative. Uh, but there is some suggestion that this might be a bit more than what surgical, surgically you can guarantee an R0 resection. So what would you do? So I guess uh, what 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 you discussed right now, debulk the tumor and uh, debulk the tumor and um, uh, put him up for definitive uh, chemo radiotherapy. What's a better option than this? So give him neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Yeah, anyway. absolutely. I would do neoadjuvant chemotherapy for this guy. That's the answer. That's the one I would do. I don't like to talk about debulking as a treatment philosophy. So what I would do. If I'm unsure that I can get the vessels off and things like that, it looks like it's invading a bit more, I would actually give neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So give him three cycles, restage him, see how you go. And if you feel that he is downstage, then you offer him surgery. You understand? That's the way the yes. treatment goes. Okay, so now my next question to you is, I've got so many things to ask you, but time is short. So I will ask you my next question, which is, uh, let me just bring it up, okay? One minute, I'm trying to bring it up. So I'll ask you a simple question now. Describe the surgery to me. Simran, describe the surgery yes, to me. Uh, so with the patient uh, on the table uh, in a supine position, we're going to have a, a roll be below his uh, shoulders to um, to uh, uh, to uh, raise the level of the chest. Uh, so. Uh, I, I would like to do a, a full sternotomy uh, for exposure. Okay. What are, uh, what are the various access that you can have for anterior mediastinal tumors? Name the access that I can have. Uh, so um, the access could be uh, uh, sur uh, extended uh, cervical uh, uh, approach. Cerva it can be cervical. Limited, uh, limited. Extended cervical, you say? Uh, yes, sir. With a... With a uh, uh, manubriotomy with a cervical incision and extending onto the manubrium. So start with simple st median sternotomy first. Then median, what else? Median sternotomy. So median sternotomy. Median sternotomy with the with the clamshell. Okay. Um, Not median sternotomy with the clam clamshell stands by itself. So clamshell means going across. Yes, sir. You don't need to do a sternotomy in a clamshell. Right. Yeah. So. Okay. In a clamshell, you just go across and open it up, and that's it. Yes. You may have to do if you need to dissect into the neck. But yes, sir. if you do a clamshell, and usually you do a clamshell when the tumor is extending into both the pleuras. So one is median sternotomy, two is clamshell, three. So if the tumor is less than uh, five centimeters, then we can do a wax or a robotic approach okay. as well. Yeah, fine, fine. That's good, but not in this patient. Yeah. Not in this patient, sir. Okay. This uh, space, the tumor is more on the left. So, what do you think you could do? So, we can uh, we can do a thoracotomy, uh, thoracotomy as well for the uh, for the approach. Hmm. Would you do a thoracotomy in this guy? What would be a better approach if the tumor is on the left side? There the is hemi, 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 hemi clamshell. Hemi clamshell. So a sternotomy and a hemi clamshell is a better yes, approach in this. Yes, sir. I would think it would be a more sensible approach. If you do yes, a thoracotomy, sir. you may get away with it. But the problem is if, you know, medially the aorta and the SVC is involved and you come from the left side, there is no way you can do an SVC resection. 
You agree? Sure. Yes, sir. In this patient, I would do a sternotomy. I'd open with a sternotomy. Yes, and sir. I'd go across on the left side and do a heavy clamshell. Yeah, I'll show you one. Yes, sir. Something like this. Can you see my yes, screen? Sir. Yes, sir. No, this is not this patient. It's somebody else. So you just do a sternotomy. The reason why you do a sternotomy is because if vessels are involved, you want central control. Yes, and sir. what else? What else? Why else do you do? A stomatomy. So what else case, can you do? Uh, in case you need to, in case you need to put the patient on uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, it's uh, the easiest, uh, easiest access. Absolutely correct. So that's why you do a stomatomy because you want a good midline incision and you want access to go on bypass urgently in case you screw up something or you make a hole in something massive. Okay. So in this particular patient, I think I would start with a stomatomy and go on to the left side and do a hemiclamshell, something like this. This sort of an incision is what I would keep ready. Yeah, so this is the sort of yep. dissection that you would do and you take out all these tumors there. Okay, uh, so we were talking about steps of operation. So I want you to describe to me what are the steps of a thymectomy? Uh, so after the start... Or, or a thymoma uh, resection, yeah. So after the uh, sternotomy, we'll... Uh, uh, open the pleural spaces and see for uh, sealing onto the on the onto the pleura. Okay, if good. there's any uh, pleural effusion, uh, which pleura will you open? Which pleura will you open? Well, uh, both of them, left and right, sir. Okay, good. I would rather open both pleuras. You're right. Okay, what else? Uh, so <coughs> then we'll uh, try to uh, try to achieve for all the the, the, the thymus and all the uh, the fat and the areolar tissue uh, from the cervical uh, extent uh, sur uh, neck up to the diaphragm and uh, uh, laterally uh, uh, up to both the both the phrenics and uh, take out all the all the soft tissues along with the uh, with the uh, thymoma if the left phrenic is involved or going through the tumor what will you do so then uh, we'll uh, we'll have to take it along with the tumor but we'll have to do a, a, a diaphragm application on, on that side is it easy to do it through a stomach Oh, no, sir. It's, it's very difficult. Okay. So, actually, you can take away the tumor and you may do the plication or you may even leave it alone and patients tolerate. A, but in a myasthenic patient, you want to actually do yes. the plication because his respiratory compromise will already be there. So, if he's myasthenic, I would do the plication. If he's not myasthenic and his preoperative PFTs were very good, then I would not bother with doing a left-sided plication. But... But both the answers are correct. There's nothing right or wrong in this, okay? But both the answers are correct. What, can you take both the phrenics? Uh, so in fact, uh, both the phrenics gone, the patient tend to do better than a single phrenic, single phrenic gone. Am I right on that, sir? Oh my God, that is completely the wrong answer. Completely the wrong answer. Bilateral phrenic is never to be done. Okay, never to be done. Right, sir. So never, ever, ever do bilateral phrenic things. Otherwise, you will end up with needing a long-term ventilatory support and you need to do a pacing device for the diaphragm. So you never, ever take both the phrenics, okay? It's very dangerous. Never, ever take both the phrenics. But unilateral phrenic can be resected. But bilateral phrenic should never be resected. Okay? Sure. All right. What are the precautions you will have in this patient for doing your surgery? What do you want in theater for doing this surgery? So, so one of the most important precautions is that we'll have a cardiopulmonary bypass standby. Thank you. Well done. Uh, what else? Uh, we'll have uh, the various grafts available in case we need to do any reconstruction of the, of the uh, SVC or the aorta if we cannot okay. get direct tissue to tissue. Uh, then uh, we'll uh, try to um, uh, just have a cell saver and uh, prep the groin in case we need to go on uh, uh, crash bypass. Yeah. As far as possible, you don't use a cell saver, but in a crisis situation, you can, yes, sir. you know. Yes, but sir. as far as possible, in a malignancy, you yes, should sir. try and not yes, to use a cell yes, saver. As a philosophy, what else will you have in theater or keep ready in the labs? So, so can, can I interrupt for a moment, sir? Yeah, sure. Who is uh, it? Uh, I, can't, uh, I can't see sir, you. Andre. 
Yeah, Andre. Andre, sir. Andre. Andre, I'm always. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sir, uh, regarding malignancy in general, um, uh, blood transfusions have uh, lead, have shown to decrease survival. That is fine. But this is autologous blood, sir, cell saver. Why is that a bad idea, sir? Because the malignancy can disseminate. If you have punctured the, when you're dissecting the tumor or something like that, and you've punctured the tumor, and you do cell saver, then you will actually cause systemic metastasis. That's why. Okay. Because you're not filtering that, you're not uh, irradiating that blood or anything. So cell saver will suck all that uh, malignant cells in there and then you give it intravenously. Now you've got systemic metastasis. That's why you try not to use cell savers in malignancy. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, sir. Next. I, I also have one quick question. Do yeah. we attach the, yeah. the word lymph node sampling? Medicinal lymph node sampling. In we're, we're gonna, yeah, we're going to talk about that. I've got the, that question lined up. I'm, I'm still not got there. So, yeah. Do you want to let, let, let him finish all these answers? What are the sideline preparations? Then I'll show you the lymph node things. Okay, yes, go ahead. Tell me. Go ahead. Tell me. What else will you keep ready? Something to tackle the myasthenic crisis if it happens. The Sorry, I didn't hear that answer. We need to be ready to tackle myasthenic crisis if it happens during the resection. Yeah, yeah, but more importantly, you're operating. Yeah. Yeah. What do you need in the uh, in the fridge? Blood and blood products. Yeah, blood, blood products, FFP. Okay, all of this needs to be organized. This is a supra major uh, resection. This is not a walk in the park. So these are things you've got to get. What else do you need to keep ready in the theater? <clears throat> Hemostats and sealants, okay? You need All to right. have, you cannot go looking for uh, for any sealant, any hemostat after the bleeding starts. So everything should be in theater, okay? These are just things you have to have around. Okay, uh, so the question is asked about lymph nodes, okay? So in an operative strategy for lymph nodes, any suspicious lymph node should be removed. That should be a good philosophy. And that's what we do. We actually do a good mediastinal dissection along with the resection of the tumor. Okay. If it is stage one and two, then only adjacent and anterior mediastinal nodes are removed. If it's a stage three, then systematic mediastinal nodal dissection is done, particularly for paratracheal, aortopulmonary, and subcarinal. Okay. This is the philosophy. And if it is stage four, then you've got to take out everything, including supraclavicular as well, if you're ever operating on a stage four. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because, yes, sir. Yeah? Okay. So yes, sir. the answer to this question is yes, you should do a lymph node dissection. Okay. All right. Yes, now, my next question to you is if you have to do SVC reconstruction, how will you do it? Uh, so it depends on the extent of the SVC involvement, sir. Uh, if the SVC involvement is small, uh, maybe we can get away with the uh, uh, clamp and uh, sue technique, but if it's involving uh, on, on a side biter, we can uh, if if we can get away with the side biter, uh, we can use a patch for reconstruction, or we can do a direct uh, direct closure of the uh, SVC. If uh, the involvement of the SVC is uh, more than what will uh, come directly, then we might have to uh, it should cardiac pulmonary bypass and uh, 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 do the anastomosis. The anastomosis can be done either SVC SVC directly or in nominate to SVC or write IJ weight uh, to SVC. If we cannot get uh, any of uh, tissue to tissue together, then we might have to do a uh, interposition graft. Interposition graft, graft can be a vein or uh, it can be a, it can be a, a PDFE or a Dactron graft. Okay. And uh, can you knock off the brachiocephalic vein? Uh, so you can knock off the brachiocephalic because vein, the tumor but, might but, actually no. involve the brachiocephalic vein. Yes, sir. So yes, sir. You can you can knock off the brachiocephalic vein. See this picture? You can actually knock off the brachiocephalic vein. It yes, might go with the, the tumor yes. because the tumor might be involved and there's enough collateralization from the from the side. So brachiocephalic is okay. So you can do a direct clamp and so, or you can do put bulldog bulldog, reset and suture it out, or you can do an SVC to SVC left innominate or right IGV to SVC. These are all the options available to you. And uh, so these are the options. You can all do, you can go on bypass and do these operations. What is the problem of going on bypass for these surgeries? 
So the uh, issue with going on bypass is uh, when you're going to be using internal sucker, you're going to be converting a stage one, stage two to stage four. Okay, so metastasis is the problem. What metastasis else? is what else is the problem in these patients? Uh, uh, getting uh, getting cannulation uh, uh, might be an issue because if the tumor sitting right on the aorta. Uh, cannulation strategies uh, might need to be uh, thought of. So what? How would you then go on bypass? There's something you have to do preoperatively before you start the operation. Do you want to prep the groin? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, we yeah, have to be have ready to for some time. Yes, sir. So you have to prep the groin as well. You never know what yes, you sir. might come up with. So before you do the sternotomy, in fact, the groin should be prepped because you might actually get into the any vessel. You don't know what is the anatomy in there. Yes, sir. And your saw might just go through the brachiocephalic or something. So always, always, always groin is prepped. And there should yes. be a high index of suspicion uh, that you might damage a vessel. Then you must actually open the groin and keep it ready. Don't cannulate. But do the dissection in the groin and keep it ready, and then do the sternotomy. Okay. So, so. What, what what can you use for SVC resections? So uh, what? I, I didn't get the question, sir. What prosthesis can you use for SVC resection? You already answered it, but go ahead. And tell me. Uh, so so for reconstruction of the SVC, you can use the the uh, uh, saphenous vein. Uh, we can uh, use uh, PTFE grafts or we can use uh, Dacron grafts as well. Okay. Or homographs as well. Or homographs, yes sir. Yeah, all right, okay. Bovine pericardium or whatever. This is the data for SVC reconstruction, okay? So these are all the studies which have got quite, some of them have survivals, okay? So SVC reconstruction, 45% five-year survival, 56% five-year survival. So it is actually definitely a good recommended surgery. What would you do in this patient? Are we still okay? Everybody's okay? Or are you getting edgy? So okay, sir. I'm good. Okay. All right. You're good, Simran? All right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, what will you do if the pleura is involved? Pleura has got nodules on it. So we can do um, um, we can do a, a, a pleurectomy, sir. Okay, we can do a pleurectomy and resection of anterior mediastinal mass. In fact, there are papers which talk about pleuroneumonectomy as well. Pleuroneumonectomy okay? also, yes, sir. Yeah, so they talk about pleuroneumonectomy in a young patient purely because of that uh, slide where I told you. That the five year survival is 50%. Even in stage four, there is a possibility of getting a five year survival of 50%. But pleuroneumonectomies usually don't do as well. So, pleurectomy and resection of the tumor and clips and then post operative chemo or, and radiotherapy is the treatment. Okay. But there are papers which are talking about pleuroneumonectomy, and I'll show you the data. This is the data of pleuroneumonectomies and look at that 75% five year survival, 78% five year survival, okay? So these are, but not big series. There is also, what if the iota is involved? Uh, so, so if the iota is involved, uh, we'll have to assess, uh, uh, sometimes the, 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 the tumor can be uh, stuck on the iota and there might be a possibility of uh, of taking the tumor off the aorta without uh, actually damaging the aorta, but if we, that's not going to be possible, we will have to uh, uh, we will have to uh, go on cardiopulmonary bypass, school the patient, uh, go on TCA, and uh, uh, achieve uh, uh, resection of the aorta along with the tumor and uh, reconstruct uh, reconstruct the aorta. So this is the data for patients involving heart and great vessels. Okay, so they have done aortic arch resection, they have done main PA resections and they still have five-year survival, okay? So a lot of extended resections have been, not a lot, but literature has spoken about extend, extended resections in anterior mediastinal tumors, okay? So far, so far, so good? Yes, sir. What if the sternum is involved? 
so uh, we can uh, uh, excise the end block with the tumor and uh, do a sternal uh, sternal reconstruction. How will you do a sternal reconstruction? Uh, so sternal reconstruction sir can be done with the uh, uh, with the uh, polymethamethyl acrylate, or we can do it with the uh, titanium uh, titanium plates. What's the commonest thing you use? Or we can just use a we can just use a flap to uh, close the sternum. Yeah, so you can do muscle flaps. You can put in a mesh. You can put in momentum, or you can put sternal prosthesis. Okay, these are the common things that you can use for sternal reconstruction. And now the latest ones are 3D printing. Yes. Things. Okay. Is it making sense? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. I think we have <laughs> really Just covered one question. in great detail. Yeah. Come in. Who's that? Salman. Tell me. Yeah, Salman. Uh, what about these patients who are on sometimes on heavy steroids and uh, you don't get much time? Yeah, so the what philosophy of it is that the steroid must be reduced to less than 10 milligrams per kilogram body weight. Uh, not 10 milligrams, but 10 milligrams per day. So we, we reduce the steroids if they are myasthenic, then we reduce the steroids down to 10. And that is the point at which we operate. If we are worried that this guy will go into crisis, then we also do preoperatively plasma phoresis or IVIG. So these are the strategies that you use to prevent patient going into myasthenia crisis. If the patient goes into myasthenia crisis post-operatively, then you give plasma phoresis or IVIG, depending upon whatever is available in your unit. But it's a much more complex uh, situation. These patients will always need to be consented for ICU stroke ventilatory support. So now let me ask the question, since you've said that, uh, what is the post-operative management of this patient? Uh, so postoperatively, uh, the patient uh, will be going to a uh, uh, ICU, and anticipating uh, uh, ventilatory support. Mm. Uh, uh, we're going to monitor uh, uh, drain output. Would you put him? Would you take him to the ICU ventilated, or would you take him to the ICU extubated? Uh, so take him to the ICU ventilated, sir. Okay, your anesthetist will be happy with you. But uh, usually, uh, if it's a very, very big resection, which has taken five, six hours, then I would take to the ICU ventilate. If it is one or two hours surgery, and I managed to take it all out, then uh, I would actually try and extubate on table. But the right. threshold for reintubation should be very low. But these patients right. must always go to ICU, cannot go back yes. to the room. Why? Uh, so, because uh, post-operatively, the chance of uh, myasthenic crisis is, is uh, pretty high, and uh, after resection, these guys might uh, are known to go into myasthenic crisis, which need will need to be man managed uh, in an ICU setting rather than a rather than a thoracic ward or a general ward. Uh, so what ward. is the one thing you have to make sure post-operatively that you do give to the patient, even if he's not swallowing, put in an NG. What do you do? As soon as possible, what do you give? It's uh, pyridoxine and uh, neostigmine. Yeah, mestinone. You have to give his anti myasthenic yes, medication. Okay. Yeah, anti -myasthenic the commonest medicine. cause yes, sir, yes. of patient going into myasthenic yeah. crisis is forgetting to give the uh, myasthenic tablets post-operative. Okay? So as yes, soon as the surgery is finished, you uh, at the time of injury, put in an NG tube and make sure that you give these tablets down the NG tube. You have to give these tablets back, okay? Very quickly to the patient. Because anesthesia does not uh, do well in a myasthenic patient. And all sorts, and the reversal of anesthesia causes all sorts of problems. So yes. it's very important to give the anti-myasthenic tablets for these patients, okay? Does it make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Can I ask this how, last how, question? Yeah, yeah, you can ask many more questions. I don't mind. Thank you very much. What optimum age operating on these patients? Uh, if they no, are in there, adolescence. Uh, no, 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 no. There is, there is no such thing as optimum age. It's at the time of diagnosis. And we have operated even on patients who are 60, 70, 80, because this is malignancy. No, no, sir. In, in young patients, I'm talking about. There is no such thing as optimum. I don't understand your question. What do you mean by optimum age? 
<laughs> see this is a guy who's uh, sorry just one second let me log in uh, uh, one minute okay just, just one minute i think uh, vikas is not logged out okay so there is a, this guy most of the time these tumors grow you don't even diagnose them okay and then they come up with some vague symptoms and get a ct scan and then they show up with it so whenever you diagnose you must operate an anterior mediastinal mass should not be uh, you know kept there as it is <clears throat> for two reasons you have to operate number one it can turn malignant number two it can it can cause local compression so all these are indications for surgery so in my practice anybody with an anterior mediastinal mass will get an operation whether it's benign or malignant you must take them out they're not good so so i don't understand what is the question uh, uh, sorry can you see my desk it uh, seems to be frozen sir uh, hang on hang on something here okay. i tried uh, can you yep. see my okay. desktop yeah okay. yes sir Yes. So, so the answer to your question is, whenever you diagnose them, you should operate. There is no such thing as optimum age for surgery. So, usually within few weeks of uh, diagnosis, you have to operate. Even if it's an old patient, I operate on the old patient, elderly. And does that answer your question? I'm not clear what what you were asking. So I was talking about young patients, sir, in 16, 17 so, years of age. So, uh, whenever you diagnose, question. you have to operate. All right, thank you. I got the answer. Thank you very much. Yeah, whenever you diagnose, you have to operate. Are you asking whether thymectomy in myasthenia is that your question? Yes, sir. It was. It oh, was. That's a completely different. different. That's a different question. We are not uh -huh. talking about thymoma. We are talking about thymectomy in myasthenia. Okay, so there are. That's a different uh, scenario. Let me answer that question for you. So whenever I have a patient with myasthenia, and the neurologist has sent him to me for surgery. The best results are in a young patient within six months of diagnosis of myasthenia with evidence of grade one or ocular myasthenia. These are the ones who get the most benefit out of thymectomy for myasthenia. Whenever you operate on a patient for a thymectomy for myasthenia, the, you have to explain to the patient the following results. If you operate on 100 people with myasthenia and you do a thymectomy, we are not talking about thymoma, we're talking about thymectomy, then 33% of them will completely resolve and you will have no more myasthenia. 33% of them will stabilize and there will be no progression of myasthenia, which means whatever tablets they're taking will remain the same. And 33% of them will progress irrespective of whether you do a thymectomy or not. So 66% of patients with myasthenia will benefit from surgery. 33% will not benefit from thymectomy. The problem is you don't know which group this patient will fall into. But if the patient is young, he's got early onset myasthenia within six months. If he's got ocular myasthenia or there is a presence of thymoma, these indications are the one where you operate and you operate once you've made sure that the patient is fit for surgery does that answer your question now hello salman salman i spoke for so long i missed you okay did others understand what the, the question was not about thymoma it was about thymectomy in my yes. that's a different scenario okay so are we still okay? Everybody's okay. It's seven o'clock. I think we should stop now. I think it's quite a long session. I told you it is very difficult. This topic is very difficult, but I really want to cover it in detail. Yeah, Muhammad, you asked a question. You want to ask a question? Go ahead. Uh, Muhammad? Yes, regarding, uh, regarding the first, the first slides about the classification of the mediastinum or the the department of the mediastino. Uh, okay. I remember in uh, Birmingham course, they told us there is a new classification, not superior, inferior, and uh, they said there is a new classification. Uh, it's called prevascular and uh, vascular, yeah. paravertebral. Yeah, yeah. So they, I, they I, I've us got they ask us. Yeah. You, you can answer any of these because the others have not been discon discontinued. Okay, I've got that prevascular and all that as well. I've got the uh, classification. It is there. You're right. But uh, the others have not. Uh, I'll just show you. Where is it? Uh, hang on. Where is it gone?
So prevascular, retrovascular, and peripharyngeal esophageal space. Yeah. So it doesn't. No, they say uh, uh, prevascular, uh, visceral, and paravertebral. Three compa compa yeah, compartments. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. Prevascular, yeah. retrovascular, and peripharyngeal esophageal. These are different terminologies meaning the same thing. So one is a posterior mediastinum, one is anterior mediastinum, one is visceral in the middle. Okay, it doesn't matter. It it any one of these, if as long as you're able to tell me one of these, I'll be happy in the FRCS exam. Okay. Okay. There thank no, you. No, there are various. Uh, there are various ways they have been staged. It doesn't matter which you. one you tell me. You should know one, which you should know well. I will not fail you if you say one and not say the other. Okay. Go ahead. So I think uh, we've had a lot of discussions. There were a lot more questions which I wanted to ask you, Simran, but I think the time has gone by. It's almost two hours. And I think it's physically not possible for you to stay alert. So thank you very much, everybody. Anything else you want to ask? There is a lot of chat going on. I don't know what's going on. Let me, let me stop sharing and come back to this. Is there anything here which I need to look at? Vikas, just look at the... Uh, no, sir, no, sir. Is there anything? Sir, nothing, nothing, in the nothing, chart, nothing, nothing, nothing in the chat. Nothing in the chat. Okay. So, so was this what you want in exactly. case discussion, yes, or sir. do you want exactly? Exactly, sir. Exactly, sir. exactly sir. Mm. Okay. So I will try but, and go through all the important cases in thoracic surgery in this way. Yes, sir. Uh, that, that, it's, that, it's that's not perfect, just, sir. Yeah, it's not just about uh, trying to quiz you, but also trying to educate you, so that we have some slides which brings up and refreshes. Uh, your thoughts, yes, sir. your thoughts. Okay, and that's why it's going to take me time to prepare every topic. But I think this is a good way to do it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Yes, thank you, you so very much, much. Nikhil. Thank you so much. Really appreciate yes, it. Sir. Uh, you're welcome, Nikhil. You're the next one. Okay, next Bakra on yes, the line. Yes, sir. <laughs> next goat to be slaughtered. I'm sorry, Simran, if I was harsh, but sir, no, 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 sir, not at all, sir. It's, I, it's, I was, it's so, this is what we need, sir. Some points which, uh, you know, the problem is because you guys are cardiac and you're not uh, seeing thoracic patients regularly, you might not understand the finer points of decision making. You will and understand the, the gross ones. We don't concept. think that way, sir. Yeah, yeah that's what. So it's, it, that is why I think it's important you discuss with me and I'll be happy to put across to you how definitely, we think sir, definitely. as a thoracic surgeon. It's different. It's different from uh, thinking like a cardiac surgeon. It's completely different. So the philosophy is very important to understand. A lot of people <clears> don't understand what is the philosophy of management of a yes, case. Sir. So like, like I told you, you know, it's not, it's, there's no straightforward answers to everything. As long as you can justify your answer, I'm okay with it. I like that, Simran, you said, I would like to do R0 rejection. And that's perfectly all right. You know, that's perfectly all right. But there are other thoughts as well. You know, yes, sir. where yes, sir. can an R1 be done? Should you do an R1? But in an exam, it's okay to be safe and say, I would like to do R0 restriction. And that's okay. There's nothing lost in that. But, but, but you know, if, if somebody is pushing you, then it means there is another way. Definitely. Then, then all you have to say is, I don't know, sir. I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> okay. All right. A lovely thank session. So thank you so much. Sir. Thank good, you so much. Good. I'm, I'm happy that you guys learned. And thank you, Simran, for pushing me. <laughs> It was no, sir. It's, it, this is what we need, sir. And it was just, it was just beautiful, sir. Thank this you so exactly much. What we need, sir. Okay, good. We'll do some more sessions in this, and uh, we'll try and quiz you guys and get you. And anything else? Anybody has any comments? Any suggestions? How we can do it better or different? I'm happy to learn. So I mean, I'm, I'm okay if you. I mean, personally, I'm okay if you put this on the YouTube. But if everyone's not okay, sir, then we need to find a way of sharing this, sir. <laughs> No, I am happy to put it on YouTube. Know. I don't mind. Whoever whoever is being grilled should agree to it. As long as you give me yeah, consent, so, then I don't. Uh, so please, please put it. Yes, I mean, because, uh, this, yeah, this because is, we need to go back to this again and again.